And here is the Magus of the day, uh, Tony Grafton. Well, let me relieve any apprehension by saying that I'm aware that uh, the day has been long, the first drink beckons, and we want to hear from Ben more than we want to hear from me. So I will try to be as brief as these wonderful generalists have been. So let me just start with a short passage from the inventory of Vermeer's estate, which appears in Appendix G. Not That's not the theses. It's actually the inventory and, and other documents in Ben's book. In the Great Hall, a, peasant, a, a painting representing a peasant barn, another painting, two paintings, three small drawings, a drawn coat of arms with ebony frame, a pair of green silk curtains with a valence in front of the bedstead, a mantelpiece covering of the same material, a striped curtain, an iron armor with helmet, a pike, a lead hat fringe, linen and wool, a Turkish mantle, a white satin skirt, a ditto yellow, a white satin blouse, um, an ash gray travel mantle, a black Turkish mantle, 21 children's shirts, so good as bad, two women's shirts, two 28 bonnets, two Indian coats, two night shirts, nine red leather Spanish chairs, and more. Vermeer was, among other things, the first declutterer we know about in human history. <laughs> Vermeer's house was a clutter museum. Vermeer's little Dutch rooms where little Dutch people do little Dutch things, as we wonderfully heard, is something very different. It's a theater, it's a performance, it's a representation, and it pulls us in and it commands us and it makes those of us who were scholars come up with theories, good, bad, and indifferent. It compels artists in the most extraordinary way. And that, for me, was perhaps the most passionately wonderful thing we heard today, the way in which Vermeer still has this pull over contemporary artists of so many different kinds. So what to say about the book and the day? I find myself in the position of a 15th century aristocrat, Jean de Lannoy, who was in the court of my favorite 15th century official, Anthony the Great Bastard of Burgundy. Uh, that's not a reference to his character. He was illegitimate. And this was one of the new Renaissance courts. It was filling up with experts, lawyers, and humanists. And Jean writes to his son and says, you have to go to school. Because I sit in this court, and these eloquent and learned people speak one after another. And then the great bastard turns to me, and all I can say is, Master Jean, or Master Philip, has spoken well, and I agree with him. And that's more or less how I felt all day. <laughs> I found myself agreeing with each speaker in turn. So what to say, and, and I still find myself somewhat embarrassed. So what to say about this? First of all, I don't think anybody has quite managed to convey the richness, the provocation, the occasional irritation. Actually, I think Ben conveyed that better than anyone else. Uh, and the extraordinary stimulation that come with this amazing book. It's a book like no other that I've ever read in the passion with which every rabbit that appears is chased down its hole, down which you find yourself falling after Ben, to a tea party or a garden where you're ex the most extraordinary thing. There is no historian who is not interrogated, no theorist with whom there is not a debate, no piece of evidence which is not pulled up and looked at from every imaginable angle. And that's hard to read. <laughs> it goes on a bit. <laughs> it demands of a reader a kind of passionate and creative attention, almost like that which we owe to Vermeer himself. And I think that that's a wonderful quality. Um, and yet, at the same time, and I think the last speakers have really made this clear, it isn't and can't be complete as an account, either of Ben's thinking then or of Ben's thinking since then because so much of it deals, as everything in the humanities deals, with knowledge, part of which always remains tacit, part of the grounds of which can never be stated clearly. This is a basic to all attribution studies in any field, that part of the grounds always seem to remain tacit. But it, it's particularly strong here. So it's an extraordinary experience to read it. And I do recommend it to everybody. You find yourself learning an amazing amount about Delft, about Vermeer, about the family, about art history. 
uh, and how it might be and might not be done. Uh, and I don't actually know who could come up with an adequate critical judgment of the whole. Maybe that's the charitable explanation to take for the lack of a, a serious review. I found myself thinking that another of Ren Weschler's favorite people, uh, a contemporary of Vermeer's in Rome, Athanasius Kircher, might be the right person to review it <laughs> with the, the right combination of erudition and acute visual sensibility, a passion to chase every rabbit down its hole. It would take a polymath of that kind to do real justice to this extraordinary book. So a word about each of the three sessions that we've heard dealing with it. The art historical session fascinated me. I was brought up to this field at the Warburg Institute as a tot, and I was taught by the great Gombrich that art history, like Caesar's goal, is divided into three tribes um, who are distinct, though not necessarily unfriendly to one another. Um, there are the art historians, there are the academic art historians, the connoisseurs, and the critics. And, uh, and for him, this was all part of the, the legion of art historians. And you know, if you think about art history just from the outside, that's kind of how it looks. Indeed, over the course of the 20th and 21st centuries, these tribes have in some ways grown institutionally more separate rather than less. Um, there are the art historians in the limestone and brick bastions of their university buildings, um, no longer separated from the rest of us by the wonderful exercise of the slide table. That was what I always liked best about giving art historical lectures, was playing with the slide table and getting the double slides ready, and then attempting, as a poor historian, to control the projectors. <laughs> but you know, doing the work that they do, which is a very particular kind of work and has its uninterrogated assumptions, as we heard. There are the connoisseurs in museums, another limestone-protected brand of castle, uh, but also in the great art dealers and in other places, doing their work lining things up, authenticating and deauthenticating unless the mezzanine intervenes. And finally, there are the critics um, who are sometimes described as in decline, but I must say I don't see it. The criticism is clearly in transformation as the, the traditional um, f written platforms of the, the quarterly and the newspaper either disappear or devote much less space to criticism. But the digital world has materialized as a platform that allows for a vast amount of criticism and the articulate and wonderful generalists, and that they were, who spoke last. And I wasn't actually sure where Jim Elkins belonged in this. He might perhaps have belonged in the third panel as well as the first, suggest that criticism is not, not dead at all. What struck me most listening was the way in which that distinction of tribes really doesn't hold, and the way in which their activities leak into one another at every point, so that making attributions both depends on and generates critical judgments and is in turn always embedded in an art historical argument of some kind, which isn't always made explicit and sometimes isn't conscious. So I found myself thinking that one of the great virtues of this book is precisely, as uh, Martha Hollander started out by saying, just to make one think again. Scholars have practices, just as artists have practices. And some of those practices you learn with great difficulty and attention, and some of them you just imbibe in the seminar, where you learn that some issues are important and other issues aren't. Um, the making of the catalogue raisonné is one of those practices which to a non-art historian always seems extremely odd, because you get this list of works, as Ben has argued, set out in a chronological order, but often not explicitly related to one another. Um, physically impossible in the book form to relate to one another. That's where this and, of course, the web have possibilities that the book doesn't. And associated with arguments that never, in fact, clarify the exact uh, reasons why things have been placed where they are in the catalog, um, because that's the practice. So I found myself thinking that one thing Ben might do if art historians would read his book is put them in the position of Lucky Jim in Kingsley Amos's novel. And you may remember that King Lucky Jim had written an article on the influence of the shipbuilding techniques on the English economy from 1450 to 1480, which begins with the sentence, this strangely neglected subject. <laughs> and at one point, as Jim is beginning to become really disaffected with the academic world, he finds himself thinking, this strangely neglected what? 
this strangely what subject, this what neglected subject. And I think that act of self-scrutiny is one that I could easily imagine being provoked uh, in any art historian who takes the time and care to read this extraordinary book with scrupulous attention. The panel of the painters was revelatory in more ways than a mere historian would try to evoke. But I was especially struck by a couple of points, um, particularly by the wonderful generosity of April Gornick's example of thinking about the beauty in Elizabeth Vermeer's face and in the portrayal of her, and the way that that seemed to be the first in a series of urgings to think about the inferior and indeed the Maria paintings on their own terms, not as something worse, but as something different, or some things that are different and might have their own logic and their own beauty. And that seemed to me to continue in the course of the discussion down actually to the second to last talk. One, I was struck by Otherwise, by the extraordinary way in which the artists seem to me to coincide in holding opposites in tension. And of course, the last talk made this absolutely explicit. Fitzgerald says somewhere that a poet is someone who can have two completely opposed ideas in mind and just go on functioning splendidly as a poet. And uh, it was wonderful to hear at least three of the artists bring out in different ways what they saw as the fascination of the technology that Vermeer applied. And Chuck Close asked, you know, what was it like the first time somebody saw the, these tricks? Well, the first time somebody drew a magic lantern, a related piece of technology, it's, it's a 15th century drawing. And what it shows you is a devil being projected on the wall. And the Latin motto says, this will scare the crap out of anybody who sees it, especially at night. This was a tremendous set of technologies. And Delft was a city of technological, of innovators with it. And one got that sense. But at the same sense, even Chuck Close, the most passionate technologist in the bunch, couldn't stop himself from evoking the magic that's there, too. To hear him say, I can tell you how any painting in the history of the world was done, but not the woman in the red hat. <laughs> that was an extraordinary moment. But I thought it was, in a sense, most revealing to hear the generalists speak. Because what the generalists did in their generalist way was to raise in multiple forms the question of what critical judgment of a hypothesis like this should be, what kinds of information it should take into account, what kinds of questions it should ask, what, what, what kind of theory we're actually looking at here, even if we had some fruitful disagreement about whether, whether there is a theory and what that theory actually is. Critics have that great ability to step back from the details of the debate and suggest to us that there are principles at stake. And we really ought to identify some of those principles before we start arguing about the minutiae. And I think that that's something that in no discipline in the humanities happens often enough, precisely because we don't invite informed outsiders in who can take the, the look at us of the child taking notes at the dinner party and say, you know, there are some interesting implications to this of a general kind, which you all might want to think about a little more than you obviously have. I will add my own historian's widow's might to this, since though history received a few mentions, it didn't get a deep look in. Uh, it's when I read this book, I was in a perpetual fury for two reasons, um, one of which was Ben's habit, which he himself has already identified, of treating hypotheses as facts which could then be built on, um, which we don't do in my line of work. Or at least if we do do it, we get severely penalized for it by our colleagues. But he's already um, taken that on board, I think. And it's, it's really more a rhetorical problem than anything else, although it is, I think, a persistent one. The other thing that worried me was a habit, what seems to me in a method of proceeding which no one has yet identified, that Ben tends to make a general statement about how things are, either how things are in 17th century Holland, say most people don't have a formal religion. Not right. Or how artists work. I mean, a good artist can't go to a, a less good work in, in immediate succession. 
And you know, historians tend to go the opposite way. We tend to say, you know, an artist does what Vermeer did, and you know, maybe Vermeer had bad days. We work up from the bits and pieces of the record to our generalization, rather than using the generalization as something on which we can actually build. And it, it may sound like a small and pedantic point, but I think it's something to think about as this extraordinary first work, and I think it is an extraordinary first work, becomes only the first in a series of books which will have the same kind of force, power, brilliance, and curiosity, and possibly thanks to Wren, you know, nobody, you know, he can raise welts like nobody else, so thanks to the training that he's provided, will be uh, more disciplined and less likely to make readers see red than to make them see hypotheses they want to grapple with. Finally, a more general point. I don't think we're in any position now to know whether those, ex those different paintings are the work of Maria Vermeer or not, but I do think it makes a huge difference to know that. Ivan Gaskell's a wonderful historian, but I, I will disagree with him on one point. Historians do work with generalities and norms, and we establish them. But one reason we do that is to excavate the moment that doesn't fit them, that's attested by the sources, the moment that absolutely stands out, that leaps forward and tells us something different is happening. This is the great lesson that Carlo Ginzburg taught us with the cheese and the worms two generations ago. Now, we've learned from Martha that having a young woman do painting of high quality is not remarkable in this society. But if a young woman was engaged in the kind of wonderful emulative relationship with her father that Ben describes, and if out of that emulative relationship came the woman in the red hat, that's news. That is one of those moments which historians live for excavating, at least in my part of the history world, I promise. So if that's right, that's something to be pursued with passion and devotion, as you already have, but pursued deeper and in the light of a richer sense of fathers and daughters, women as artists, the larger social world of Dutch art into which this also is, of which this also is a piece. No conclusions, and I think that's right, because in the end, what I think of here, what I think everyone here probably thinks of first, is Ren Weschler, the only person I know, the only person any of us knows, capable of putting together this extraordinary sort of occasion, incongruous and rich and stimulating. There's a style he has, and the style is very particular. You don't get a moral. You don't get a conclusion. You get a narrative. And it's by following the narrative intelligently and carefully and devotedly that you learn. That's also how he organizes these public occasions. There's a complex narrative here. I'm not even sure how the narrative has ended, because Ben will end it for us. But that's what we've been privileged to attend to. <coughs> not a group of people trying to talk across disciplines, which usually doesn't end very well. It ends in the blather of the normal humanities center. But a group of people speaking from their disciplines to one another with attention and care and intelligence. That's the kind of occasion for which Wren stands for me and has always stood. It's what you might call, as some sociologists call, the bookshop and the library, a third place. It's not home, it's not work, it's a third place. And for intellectuals, what this institute has been is a kind of third place. It's not the place where we do our intellectual work, but it's also not some place where anything goes. It's a third place in the middle, which stands for rigor and passion and testing ideas until either they or their authors are destroyed. And above all, something missing in so much of our public and professional intellectual life, fun. <laughs> Every speaker showed so much joy today. And that, above all, was in the spirit that Ren has always embodied. Thank you so much. I'm going to miss this kind of thing. Um, 
Ben, do you, would you like to say a few last words? Because you began and you ended. And, OK, come on up, Ben. And, and, and look at it. We're going to end this thing on time. I always bring the trains in on time, too. <laughs> uh, it's, pre it's pretty hard to follow that. Uh, or all of this, uh, but it, 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 I really would uh, love the opportunity to, s to say thanks again to uh, all of these people. Uh, first of all, Ren, and, and uh, that I'm, I feel like I'm uh, privileged to be p part of. It's not just not about me or Marie Vermeer. I feel privileged to somehow become part of Ren's world uh, in a lot of different ways. But uh, I wanted to say that uh, I heard a lot of truth of different kinds from all of these speakers. And I don't have time here. And it's, we all, I could go to the bathroom. I don't know about all of you. I haven't drink a lot of water. <laughs> but uh, I, w I would have, I could have um, responded to everything that you, I thought lots of different interesting things were said about all kinds of points that I think I'm going to keep thinking about a lot. But I, I, I would like to say two things. One is that there was some. <laughs> On some level, for me, it, it is a little bit about me and the idea of thinking about this historical problem and the problem of the field and the problem of this wonderful painter and what's important. At the same time, with the, what, what I did and the, this, uh, the Jim Elkins idea that's taken up by other people about the young work, and, I, and I, someone who said to me actually was just came up and said that the Maria Vermeer seems the misfit paintings, the ostensible misfit paintings, there seems to be a greater inconsistency. There's a tremendous consistency of the ones that we have no doubt are by Vermeer. Now, that could be a, uh, explained in a lot of ways, but I feel like myself, maybe this book had uh, tremendous <laughs> inconsistencies in it. And I just think that's something interesting for me to think about, about uh, I hope I can go on, that, my, that I'm not broken in the bud like Maria Vermeer seems to have been, and, and, and try to reinvent myself. And it's wonderful to get all this great feedback. The other thing that I would say, if I had one point that I could make before you all go, because I think that you know there's things I did wrong, other things, but I also think what's great is that I'm still thinking, and I hope we all are still thinking about some points that might be just you know big enough that they go, don't get exhausted in everything that's been said today. So I would hold this little one up, that this might be a self-portrait, and what a self-portrait is. Which I don't think, I think we've really just started to open that up about that somehow like the essence of art or whatever we know about art. And that other painting there representing her, if it's not history and it's actually painting, it might intersect with all of these um, thoughts about history and art history and so on. But my last point would be that I think in my book, I didn't think hard enough about the concept of art and life in, in historical perspective of the broader reach of the Baroque, which was invoked by Vince and, and a lot of the speakers. And I think that it's not enough to say that we have it in Rembrandt. I actually think in the history of Baroque art, because it's just been mentioned, just a touch on it, from someone like Michelangelo, who is somehow transforming art that it's no longer just its ostensible public or religious purpose serving it. it Art becomes something unto itself that's different. And then you have a whole succession of people like Caravaggio or rebellious, people like Velazquez who are kind of redefining the, 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 the way that the, the role of an artist at court. Someone like Rubens who becomes uh, so important as an artist that he's actually got a fair amount of political clout uh, all across Europe. And then you get to Rembrandt where it seems to me that Rembrandt appropriates for himself that it's really, he's so important as an artist that it is about his experience. I think that gets distilled in the end in Vermeer. So my thesis that I didn't get to articulate along with everything else is that I think that Vermeer at the end of the Baroque does invent something that's very important to us about how we understand art, which has its own history and its own <laughs> becoming what it is, which is that it's about the artist. I think that's what's lurking in a self-portrait, is the artist's recognition of himself as the center of whatever art, or herself as the center of whatever art is. And I think that allowed for the possibility of this daughter, this red hat, if there is something in there that there, that um, I'll end with. Lawrence Gowing famously says, Vermeer's herb is a perfect plume thrown up by the wave of Dutch painting at its crest 
And I like to say that maybe Maria Vermeer is some kind of foam on the top of that plume of crest, but that there's really still a lot to think more about what that plume means along with a, whatever bumbling <laughs> job, I started to root out some of these things. And I thank you so much for this incredible, uh, I feel a little bit like I died and I was like, <laughs> God gave me a, a whole analysis. And I, but I, I like that pug in the story. I feel back, I'm alive. I got to live and get the whole outside uh, analysis. And, but I'm still alive here. <laughs> thank you.